Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. We have a special guest on today. Tenmori Sandararajan is a Dalit American artist, community organizer, technologist, and theorist. Currently, Tenmori is the executive director of Equality Labs, which she co founded. Equality Labs is the largest Dalit civil rights organization working to empower caste oppressed people in the United States and globally. Through her work at Equality Labs, then Mori has mobilized South Asian Americans towards dismantling eons long systems of oppression with the goal of ending caste apartheid, gender based violence, white supremacy and religious intolerance. Her intersectional, cross-pollinating work helps to create a more generous, global, expansive, and inclusive definition of South Asian identity, along with safe spaces from which to honor the stories of these communities. Tenmori's work has been highly recognized by several prestigious organizations, including the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the National Science Foundation, and many more. She was also an inaugural fellow of the Atlantic Foundation for Racial Equity and is a current fellow at Stanford Center for South Asian Studies. You can order her groundbreaking and revelatory new book, The Trauma of Caste, from North Atlantic Books by following the link in the show notes of this episode. To learn more about her work around caste equity, abolition, and healing, visit her website at dalitdiva.com. Here's the Mori now. There are some interviews that I do with people where I am so moved just to know that they exist. (laughs) I'm so moved to find out about their work and what they've had to push through and overcome and the roadblocks put up and the, the response, the hate in response to what they're doing, that they've had to just keep persevering against, around, in order to just be here today talking with us. So good to talk to you. And please introduce yourself and let the listeners know a little bit about you, and then we will explore a lot more. Sure. So happy to be here, Rachel, and really happy to be in beloved community with all the listeners that are joining us today. Um, my name again is Thenmori Sandarajan, and I'm the executive director of a Dalit civil rights organization called Equality Labs and the author of the new book, The Trauma of Caste, a Dalit feminist meditation of survivorship, healing, and abolition. And for me, it's really powerful to be able to talk about this work because it's been my life's journey to not only break the silence about caste, but to also come out as a survivor of religious abuse and gender-based violence to find a pathway of healing for all survivors. And so that's why I wanted to really get into it with you because you really hold so many nurturing conversations about what it means for us to pass through the the wound of trauma, but also for us to find healing and power at the end of that journey. Mm, Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. So then, Mori, I'm wondering about how you got started. I know that people can find out a lot about you by hearing you on different shows and reading your book. But for us to know here today, just have a glimpse of how things started to change for you and why you went in this particular direction. Well, I think that, you know, cast was a defining thread in my entire life. And for listeners who don't really know a lot about caste, It's a system of exclusion, analogous, but not the same as race. It has its origins in 2000 BC in Hindu scripture, but is now found in all religious communities of practice within the South Asian community. And 
this system is really depraved because it has this social fiction where it sets up a small group of people at the top of this pyramid of hierarchy, um, which were the priests or the Brahmins who wrote these scriptures. And then every other class or caste of people have, you know, degrading levels of purity and less and less desirable work. So underneath the Brahmins or the priests are the Kshatriyas who are the rulers, the Vaishyas who are the merchants, and then the peasants or the, the Shudras. And then outside of that are people who are seen as spiritual criminals, those who have been so wicked in a past life that they deserve to be shunned in the present, and therefore they're seen as untouchable, spiritually defiling, and given the worst of jobs, segregated into separate places of worship, separate places to live, and, um, you know, and experiencing punishing structural exclusion. And that's the community that my family came from. There's also an indigenous group of people that are outside of this caste system that are called Adivasi and are also seen as caste oppressed. So with my family, they were very desperate to leave the system of caste apartheid in India. So they fled to the United States and um, tried to rebuild their life here. But they were Dalits living in the closet, um, running and passing and hiding. And as a child who grew up in a family that was terrified of being outed, it was extremely traumatic because even though they didn't say the word caste, it was there in the shadow of everything that they did. They hid key details of their life. My mom worshipped as a Christian, uh, which is seen as a caste oppressed faith, you know, in closet and fear. And it was just so frustrating. And I also saw them really struggling with their own, you know, intergenerational trauma because they had panic attacks and anxiety and nightmares. And, you know, as a child, when you don't have language for what's haunting your parents, it makes you become a seeker, you know, a seeker both to like, what is the structural harm that is shaping what's going on for your people, uh, but also a seeker for the solution. So that really was like the driver for me as a child. And it's become the continuous thread for all of my work, because as I've dug deeper and deeper into the system of caste, not only is it, you know, incredibly violating and exclusive and impacts over 1.9 billion people in South Asia and 5.7 million South Asian Americans in the U.S., it's a deep source of intergenerational trauma and violence. And that's really why I wrote this book and I called it The Trauma of Cast was that I wanted a platform for our community to really confront our historical demons and to, to use the, the cast soul wound um, as a pathway for healing and reconciliation. Okay. So, you know, healing and reconciliation, those are amazing goals, not very easily achievable. And it takes a lot and it takes a lot of perseverance. I want to talk a little bit about that before we get more into what you were saying before, just about what you've dealt with, just so people have a sense of you and your personal experience of pursuing this before we talk a little bit more about it. So what's it been like for you? Well, I think it's really profound for the listeners here to think about the fact that caste oppressed people are one of the largest minorities in world history, you know. Uh, you know, when you think about caste impacting 1.9 billion people, one in four people in the world live under a caste system, and yet nobody talks about it. And I think a big part of the reasons why we don't talk about it is because of the punishing violence and impunity and the severe taboo that has existed about caste. And I certainly confronted that as someone who came out as a caste-oppressed Dalit person uh, when I was 18, um, from the minute I came out, I faced rape threats, I faced death threats, I faced sneers and slurs. Even now, uh, as the director of Equality Labs, um, you know, we have conducted the first survey documenting caste discrimination in the United States, and we found one in four people experience physical and verbal violence, uh, one out of three educational discrimination, and two out of three workplace discrimination. And so because of that, over half the people that took our survey said they preferred to live in the closet. And that's tremendous. I totally get that because, you know, even doing the survey, 
even being researchers and civil rights advocates, we face that continuous bigotry and disinformation. And we just had this incredible win in Seattle where Seattle became the first city to ban caste discrimination. And throughout the entirety of that process, people called us terrorists. People called us the hate group. Um, there was like attempts to deny my caste, uh, ex- my caste experience and my caste background and the death threats and the violence. It's just ongoing. And I think that that's very much a process of what it means to confront such tremendous intergenerational violence. There is so much fear in the bodies of the privileged about what happens when we have a true accounting of what's happening to Dalit people. You know, when we use the words of trauma to really talk about systems of exclusion, we're asking for a different way that we hold reckoning. You know, it's not just about data and facts and figures. It's about how these systems live in our body. It's about how we are creating continuous processes of exclusion when we operate mindlessly and repeat patterns of nervous system conditioning that that create um, inequity. And, you know, my book is a big call for us to slow down to pay attention, to listen and witness to Dalit people as we speak about the pain that we're urgently trying to turn into power at this time, but also for the privilege to really sit and think about, why am I so discomforted at the prospect of equity? Why do I go to a survival level threat alarm in my body at the idea of a Dalit saying, I've been harmed by caste and I just want to be free? Right. You know, I I like also that, you know, you call this equality labs, like this is a laboratory. This is a way to explore. This is a way to experiment, a way to research. It's something that I think is very commendable that along the way where you can be very clear about a lot of things, there's still a lot of things that do need to be experimented with where other voices need to be heard, where you get to figure out what's happening and why also there is pushback why things are slower to change. I think there is also the the general sense psychologically and sociologically of the fear of change, which coincides with some of this too, which sometimes doesn't have as much to do with how people feel about people within different caste levels, but just change in and of itself. What do you think about that? You really kind of hit the nail on the head with that because, you know, for me, I think one of the things that's different when survivors lead and when feminists leads is that we are experimenting with new models of consent and with new organizational practices that center effective boundaries around all systems of exclusion. And that is not going to happen by simply transposing the old ways of doing into a new pattern. We actually have to play and be able to give our, you know, have courage to try new processes of building consent and the assertion of boundaries in all of these different domains. And um, and I think this is one of the gifts that I think that survivors really bring to these conversations is that people often make fun of us for our hypervigilance or um, around the ways that we might po- point out what is wrong with society. But in fact, those are the frontiers of where we can experiment to build the new. And I certainly think with Dalit feminists and other caste oppressed feminists, we have had to really think about tactical explorations to free ourselves because most institutions, you know, both within the South Asian, you know, community and also within um, government and corporations, not only don't know how to serve our needs, it's not in their interest to serve our needs because there's so many people with money and power and that support harm doers that want to keep this quiet. And so, you know, whether you're experimenting at a small level with like a mutual aid group or in your local community, or you're experimenting by passing legislation or creating new intersectional platforms for multiple survivors, for multiple communities to come together, the time for feminists and survivors to experiment is now. Uh, Because despite how violent the blowback has been to our wins and our presence in society, Um, We should not be intimidated by the bad actors and the bigotry. We need to keep putting our radical imagination right at the heart of where we can build that world where we know that we can be free and consent is returned in all domains. I love that idea. And I think it's interesting, too, because 
The word cast, well, it's not the same as spelling as having a cast. I, I see it so much like having a cast where it is something that hardens around you and holds you in place. And it can also be broken. And it's just a fascinating thing to me that though it takes so much force and fortitude to break through. I'm wondering also about the religious overlay, because that's a whole other piece to this that I would love for you to explore with us about how it plays a part in your vision of this and maybe what makes it hard to make these changes if there is a religious component or how a religious component actually makes it easier to look at it in a whole new way in a more kind of spiritual way than just seeing people as less than, um, but rather seeing people as all equal spiritually. So I would love for you to talk about that. Thank you for this question, Rachel, because I have to say that in writing this book, I really didn't feel like all the parts of myself were integrated until I sat down to um, really weave the threads of my own pain into the lessons that I explore in this book. Uh, because I could, you know, I've been an expert around caste equity and Dalit feminism for many years now. But what I was processing intellectually was very separate from the pain that was in my heart, my body, and my spirit. And, and I think it's because, you know, some wounds, especially those that are structural, are so deep that we, our consciousness occludes them because to actually confront them is to, you know, really be ready to have a container big enough to hold all the grief that it contains. And um, for me, I think that abuse that comes from caste, because we certainly, you know, we have on every indicator, we face underdevelopment, systemic violence. And all of that, you know, the political economic exclusion that you think would come with the system like race or caste. But the hardest thing for me to really face was that I was a survivor of religious abuse. And for any of your listeners who have survived abuse in a religious system, either as a, you know, child sexual abuse survivor of the Catholic Church or um, people that have been part of cults, um, religious abuse is so intimate and so violating because it's disruptive to your relationship to the divine. And all of us have that human right to explore the existential. And I always thought about it because it was like, you know, other people look at the stars and they're like, you know, what's my place in the universe? And for Dalit people, it's always that we have experienced such punishment and shunning and the repetitive message that we are not spiritually worthy, it becomes so difficult to be, be part of any organized religion. And I think for me, that experience of religious violence is what actually pushed me to become such a determined religious seeker. And, you know, I was, you know, by the time I finished high school, I had read the Bible. I had read the Quran. <laughs> I had read so many religious texts. I had gone to so many different religious communities because I was hungry to be seen and for people to not only know my experience as a caste depressed person, but also to find religious community. But it was so terrifying because for people that don't know, you know, caste has its foundations and religious scripture and practice. And so while that's not debatable, I think what people have not heard is like, what is the embodied experience of Dalit people when they hear these things? So for example, at Hindu scriptures, you know, you have scriptures that equate the womb of Dalit women to that of a jackal because we're wicked and defiling. You know, you have outright edicts for slavery and differing crime, you know, differing punishments for victims of sexual violence um, based on their caste, because some bodies are worthy of punishment and uh, some bodies are acceptable to sexually exploit. And reading those things as a child, especially as someone who grew up as both Hindu and Christian, it was so painful. And I would always wonder, like, is my womb cursed? You know, why am I not of value? Do I have not, don't I have worth? you know, in front of God. And no one had effective answers for me, you know. And that's why I think many survivors of religious abuse, when you have to break away from your institution that has harmed you, it's like a wild world where you find, um, where you have to hunt for your new spiritual home. And I think that journey took me decades. You know, sometimes I would go to 
Christian places and there's caste in Christian, you know, South Asian Christian communities. There's also caste in the Sikh community as well as in the Buddhist community. And what I learned is I had to separate the dogma and the institutional practice of religion, which is actually made by people and therefore, you know, subject to the limits of their ego, to what is actually my birthright to spirituality. And when I could separate those things and then really surrender to my own seeking, the universe opened up. The universe opened up. And and there's healing when you can create your own conduit to the divine, you know. And for me, it's like, you know, very intimate things. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I always say like, you know, I'm now a Buddhist and I'm a Buddhist the way that Alice Walker and Tina Turner are and that they've they found the path as a refuge um, from violence, from systemic violence. And for me, uh, I find it in the way that I commune with nature. I find it in the way that I heal myself and other Dalit people by speaking our truth and creating communities of reconciliation and healing. And I just find it in my own intimate meditation practice where I can really center in myself and open the channel to mystery and find that rooting in love and joy. And, you know, I, I have, I have empathy even for those who have oppressed me and empathy for those systems that are so attached. And I love that analogy you brought with the medical cast about how it's fixed and, and structured. That's the way all systems of uh, exclusion operate. And our egos can, can really struggle with the attachment Um, as we've shaped our identities around the assumptions that come from the implicit and explicit bias of systems like race and patriarchy and, and caste. But, you know, the great thing about the ego is that it's malleable, you know, (laughs) and so (laughs) we don't have to be fixed and attached. We don't want to be. So I learned that nimbleness when I took my spirituality back into my own hands and I reasserted consent into the realm of the spiritual. And, you know, again, that's a huge healing message in my book is that I really want to connect with other survivors of religious abuse because it's it's an abuse that people don't really talk a lot about because it's so personal and there's so much shame. But, you know, the shame is on those that oppress, not us. Right. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And so I talk to a lot of people, clients and otherwise, about this, that the ones who have had things done to them are the ones often walking around with shame. They're the ones who don't want to report things. They're the ones who are told it's going to bring shame on their family or on their community if they talk about what happened to them or just that it happened to them. And that the ones who are the oppressors are the ones who should be carrying the shame. But very often, the personality of the person who goes along with being an oppressor is someone who doesn't have that capacity to the degree that other people do. And so they're not necessarily having remorse. I feel like oppressors are very good at operating in the present and the future, but not the past. They don't necessarily think about the wreckage uh, that they've left behind, the tornado they've been in their world. And they don't look behind to see what they've done because I think to a certain degree, they might not care. And so a lot of the people who are the walking wounded are the ones then shamed uh, for continuing on with wanting to tell the story about what happened to them, or uh, they're told to kind of just be quiet, not make waves. But so many people are sort of built into a community to feel Shame. I I think also about leadership and, you know, going, then I want to go back to some of the other things that you mentioned. I think leadership plays such an important role. And I think about in India, having Indira Gandhi, I mean, having this woman, the first prime minister uh, twice of India, who, who is such a force to be reckoned with. And still there was so much happening to women within the country that was so set sociologically, so set religiously, that even having, I think, a woman in charge, it couldn't break the caste. It was so strong. I think that says so much. And it also says so much, I think, about the power of leadership, because I think it did give the world a a different sense, and people in India, a different sense of what a woman was capable of. And so I don't know if 
you have a sense about that, about leadership and how leadership is important in these moments of just showing people what people are made of. And I know sometimes in countries, the ones who are part of the leadership are the ones who are in the upper levels of the caste system already. So it doesn't necessarily represent all the people. Mm, but still, what have you noticed when there are different people in charge and how things change for everyone in a country? Well, I think it's so important that we really think about, you know, what do we want from feminist and survivor power centered leaders when they get into the halls of power? Because there are leaders who get there who are kind of diversity figureheads. And then there are leaders who are there that are meant to be transform, you know, transformational agents of change. And Indira Gandhi is a really good example of the, the former because Yes, she was a woman, you know, which, you know, is a great landmark. However, under her term, she actually led one of the largest sterilization projects of poor and minority and caste oppressed people that, you know, you can read a little bit about in a book called Fine Balance, which was terrifying, you know. And she also targeted religious minorities and caste oppressed people in a way that was not great, you know. So it's like, Yes, she was a woman, but was she really there for feminist and survivor politics? And and I think that, you know, it's a really important question for us because we do have powerful figures of intersectional leadership, like Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, um, you know, AOC, and so many other members of the squad. And what we see right now is that even when we get survivor power advocates into um, the halls of power, they face incredible blowback because they're trying to put feminist and intersectional tactics into practical processes of governance um, and in culture. And so I think it's very important that we have to look at not only keeping you know, our, our claim to the ring of power consistent, but that, well, you know, once we get folks into positions of power, we have to defend them and we have to keep vigilant in that defense because, you know, harm doers want to just keep, you know, harming, you know, and, and, and that really is something I think we have to really think about, which is why trauma is a useful lens, because as you spoke about earlier in terms of um, the privileged and the dominant, that they just have so little resilience when it comes to being exposed to caste and racial and gender stress, that they t their fragility often becomes the, the block towards civil rights. And that's something that we can change laws, but we have to de-escalate the nervous systems of the privileged in order to make sure that we can maintain the new status quo of our victories. And that's something I think a lot about because when it comes to caste, you know, our bigoted, our privileged, our fragile, they are so violent. And, you know, I know that when we've worked with, you know, allies outside of the South Asian community, they're like, oh my God, these dominant caste bigots have nothing on white supremacists. They are just, <laughs> they're like a whole new other world of, um, you know, being held hostage uh, to their caste trauma. But I think that, you know, as feminists, as survivor power advocates, we have to model reconciliation that is really centered, you know, first in acknowledging historical harm, but then also having allies de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. Because the, oftentimes the only way that bigots stand down is when someone who is part of their network of trust reaches out to them and works to de-escalate them. And, and it feels really challenging, especially in a time of deep polarization over many issues. But the alternative is the failure of democracy. The alternative is mass genocide, which is what we're dealing with in the South Asian context. And so we have to level up as, as a species right now. And so, you know, books like The Trauma of Caste and other folks that are bringing the lens of trauma to the work of racial healing, like Resma Menachem and Ruth King and Rhonda McGee, or indigenous thinkers like, you know, Maria Braveheart and Eduardo Duran, who influenced me deeply in the work I've been doing around caste. We need these uh, lights in a time of darkness because we have to change our tactical approach to those that oppose us because their 
being held hostage to trauma. And as a result, they're relentless in the ways that they want to um, defeat our work towards equity for all. Mm. My goodness. So there's so many quotables just now with <laughs> things that you just said, but I wrote down so many, including to deescalate the nervous system of the privilege. I love that line a lot. And I think that there's so much about that, that people can sometimes not admit that it's coming from a nervous place, but instead um, overcompensate, I think, by pontificating, by being overly sure. And still at the end of the day, the, the message is, I'm scared. <laughs> That's what I hear. That's what I hear. I'm scared. I'm scared of change. I'm scared of things being different. I don't know what that's going to look like. And I don't know if I can handle something that feels different because my nervous system doesn't necessarily accommodate well to change, to new things. And people also who have, sometimes people who come from a privileged place, as you know, as you've studied, I'm sure, can sometimes really catastrophize um, because they have this sense that if things are different, they're going to be worse. They're going to be bad. Um, let's hold on to what we know. And sometimes they don't have the capacity to handle stress and strain because they haven't. It's like a study that was done about kids who are gifted and how a lot of them have a hard time taking on, let's say, a new musical instrument uh, or learning a new language because they're not used to that feeling of not mastering something right away and they can't sit with it. And ones who don't come to things as easily, don't have as much of a charmed existence intellectually, et cetera, don't have as much trouble handling things like discomfort. And so I think that does certainly play a role here. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, this really brings another uh, body of work from, you know, survivor theory that I really also want to introduce to our listeners, which is the work of Jennifer Freyd. Um, I don't know, Rachel, if I'm saying her name right, but um, and the work that she's done around DARVO and um, and, you know, for folks that don't know DARVO and Rachel, I'm sure this is, you know, something that you can speak more from an expert position. But DARVO, you know, stands for deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. And it refers to that phenomenon that you see when you support survivors where they're harm doers instead of acknowledging that harm has occurred. They deny that it has happened. They then attack the victim. And then they say that they're, <laughs> that they're the victim instead of um, the offender. And, you know, you just have to look at what happened with the Johnny Depp trial and the Amber Heard fiasco to kind of see Darvo in full display. And, you know, certainly with like Me Too, we've seen this Darvo come into play all the time. But I also think it's really important for people who are you know, thinking about survivor power broadly in society is that the principles of DARVO actually operate, you know, more than in just the interpersonal context. They're there in all of the battles related to structural systems of exclusion. And so when I think about the ways that, you know, Black scholars are being banned, you know, when I think about the fights against critical race theory and that there are people in Tennessee, parents in Tennessee that were trying to pass a law saying that white children were being traumatized by learning about, you know, this, the history of slavery. That to me is Darvo on a structural scale. And, and it was so helpful for me as a cast depressed person to learn about Darvo, to start to see this is exactly what happens with the bigots that oppose caste equity. Because even though you have, you know, numerous data at this point that caste exists in the United States and North America, you have so many personal testimonies, coverage in all the major news outlets, you will have bigots that say people that bringing this up are lying. Like, <laughs> it doesn't exist. And in fact, these are people that are anti-Hindu and, um, and they're hate groups. Um, and it's such, a, it's such a good example about how a survivor's perspective on the world gives us tools to, an anal um, to analyze structural problems um, broader than our world of survivorship, which can sometimes feel like 
you know, you're in that space, but I really want to empower survivors that are listening. You are leaders in every domain of society, you know? And one thing I remember Tarana Burke saying to me from the Me Too movement, um, because I'm also on the board of Me Too, was like, you know, when we're thinking about survivor power, it's not just about, you know, holding our harm doers accountable. You know, she said, like, survivors are in every domain of society, your lawyers, your post, your post people, you know, your nurses, you know, your clerks in stores. We are everywhere. And if we mobilize that voting block, we can change society to be a place where we're seeing consent return. And when she said that to me, it was like a light bulb open to me because I think that so much of what happens with caste is you focus on an individual crime, you know, and and there's this like terrible, terrible case that just happened in the state of Uttar Pradesh that people are really reeling from where this young 16-year-old girl had her spine broken and was raped in heinous ways. It was a gang rape. And the police burned her body so that there would be no investigation against the will of the family. And just today, as we're recording, all, you know, three of the four uh, rapists were acquitted of rape. So it's just that, you know, at a time when we face such punishing violence, you can get into that cycle of this one case, this one, you know, process, but it's structural impunity. And the state wants to apply DARVO on Dalit people and say, you know, we're not responsible. You guys are. And I think we need to take our uh, the power in our hands as survivors and say, no, never again to this violence. Let us build consent in all domains and let us heal. Oh, it is such a disturbing story. And I know that it's not, uh, you know, one of a kind, unfortunately. I mean, there are, there, there are the stories that stay with us forever that we hear and that there are many we don't hear. And I'm so, it's horrifying that this happened to this woman and the collusion, the protecting of the perpetrators and, you know, the message that sends to everyone else and to all the other women in that town and other towns. And I think those stories are very powerful to me because it shows how much power people have in those moments, like the police officers who just decided to burn this person's body, as opposed to bringing people to justice. They had a choice and they made the wrong one, but they had a choice. And it could have gone very differently for this woman and for all other women in, again, in that town and future generations. And also it builds more of kind of a monster when perpetrators know they can get away with things. You just have more crime. So I don't know why a police officer would would do that, but it happens everywhere. It's really, it's really awful to hear about that. Well, I do think that a story is the shortest distance between two people. And in a lot of ways, stories and art are one way to activate the, the heart. And when you are able to move the heart, you're able to move the mountain around some of these very difficult policy issues. And I think about that a lot because, again, we just came from Seattle where we won this historic win where Seattle is the first city to ban caste discrimination. And um, hundreds of caste oppressed people testified online and in person. And what you could see was the tremendous courage it took to come forward. We had, you know, people who waited at 2 a.m. in the morning to give testimony at 2 in the afternoon for only 30 seconds because of how important it mattered to have their voice registered. And some people, and I think about, you know, this one colleague, Rita Mayer from Tasveer, who is an indigenous caste oppressed person, and her voice was shaking and she was crying when she gave her testimony because of how much it costs to come out when you're afraid of all the violence. And yet she was there turning pain into power. And I think that, you know, so much about violence is that it breaks meaning. And so when survivors tell our stories, we're reasserting control back over the narrative that harmed us. And it can be healing to be seen. It can be healing to have empathetic witness and to be able to understand, you know, that crack that occurred in your ego from the pain. It can become, uh, you're never going to be who you were before the violence, 
but it becomes it become a new growth that allows you to find new opening, both to the human experience, but also to your fellow, you know, human kin. And so I find that we need stories to be able to create the world that we want and to look clear eyed at our pain, but also to know how we can chart our path for that healing future. Mm. Oh, I love that about stories. It's the shortest distance between people. There is something about connecting, having people tell their stories. When going back to this idea of spiritual abuse, because it's so much of what I deal with, there are so many people who really felt uh, for their whole lives uh, uh, up until, you know, coming out of it or talking to me or others about what they went through. They felt that they were being offered the truth over and over and over again. Why would they think otherwise? And wasn't until they had some distance from it that they saw the level of coercion and fear-based teachings and, and as a means of control. And also when it's spiritual, as you know, there is this whole other layer of feeling like you can't argue with it. I mean, just the idea that people are going to be of a lower caste because they committed some crime or spiritual crime in a past life. There's no proof of that. And I'll just say that, even though I'm sure that'll be argued with. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not a tangible, it's not a quantifiable, measurable, provable thing. It's just stated. But when it's stated by someone who's in a position of authority and a religious authority, there's a, oh, okay, well, now it makes sense. I mean, there's the equation suddenly given um, where X is still invisible, but seems to have been defined by someone else. So you go along with it and it can change someone's life in every way when you go along with that story. But it happens so often that people say, I didn't know that I could argue because I thought I was I would be disobeying God or the gods, whatever the tradition is. And so, so much of it tends to be, I think, a, a coercive maneuver when something is just stated as fact with a lot of boldness, I think, and a lot of what feels like irresponsibility towards people, but with a lot of just being very sure, but that you feel that you just can't argue. So, let's talk about. This intersectional piece that, you know, that you've mentioned and the coercive control and what people have to somehow make their way through just to get clarity about what's real and what isn't. So I think what is really important for people to know is that, you know, in my organization, Equality Labs, we are Dalit feminist led and survivor led. You know, we are, many of us are survivors of gender-based violence and caste-based violence. And so this really informs the way that we look at building survivor power around issues that matter to us, whether it's about racial injustice or caste inequity or gender-based violence or religious intolerance. And, and I think what's really, you know, critical, I think, for listeners to kind of think about is that when we're talking about building um, a feminist intersectional survivor power driven platform for our communities. It's not a, it's not something that we're talking about in some like ivory tower where we're just like looking out into the sky and <laughs> imagining all these like ideological connections. It comes from practical, tactical, uh, ways that we have to create mutual aid for survivors in many of the cities where we're not seeing the needs of survivors met. And this is really the heart of the Dalit feminist campaign work that we did in Seattle, uh, which took 10 years to really kind of build. But, you know, it's an example of why intersectional politics really, really matter. Uh, and, you know, to give people a sense of this is that, you know, this work for us began in like 2015 when we were partners with the All India Dalit Women's Right March. Uh, um, they're called Aid Ma'am. And they had a campaign called Dalit Women Fight, which featured survivors um, on the ground in India who were confronting their harm doers and the cities that were not prosecuting their cases. And this, they've had, you know, a march that goes to many different cities across India to call out the culture of impunity when it comes to caste-based sexual violence. And so Dalit American feminists like myself work to bring some of those leaders to meet with people all across the country in the U.S. And the wild thing about that transnational work 
was that it also exposed the level of caste that existed here in the United States and in Seattle. It really activated partners like Black Lives Matter and um, this group called API Chaya, which is one of the largest Asian Pacific Islander uh, DV providers in the city. And um, and we began a collaboration with them and another organization, a Medford Association of North America, to really explore how does caste work in our communities? And it turns out it's there everywhere and it has a very specific gender-based lens. So for, you know, survivors of gender-based violence in the South Asian community, caste is a crucial part of coercive control. So you will have things where you know, in intimate personal violence, um, partners using caste slurs to diminish their partner, especially if they're from the dominant caste and uh, the survivor is from a caste oppressed class. They will also, you know, practice untouchability, telling them that they can't go to parts of the building, saying that they're disgusting or dirty, uh, making them wash, you know, things over and over again because of their pollution. There's also a really sinister way that coercive control and caste come together in terms of transnational intimidation of survivors, where the harm doer will say, if you leave me, if you take the children, um, I will hurt your family back at home. We know where you live. We know we have control because we're dominant caste people and we can harm your parents. Um, so there's a fear of leaving because of what could happen to the extended family and to family back in India. There's also immigration issues where because caste isn't very visible um, when it comes to reporting cases related to DV, the women who survive these issues may not get a U visa, which it would discourage them, if, especially if they're on a dependent visa of their partner. Um, so it's a big part of the IPV culture of control. Um, but it's also there in terms of the way domestic labor is abused by dominant caste families uh, with wage theft and violent conditions and just general trafficking of migrant labor. And so as we worked on these issues, for it was really important for us. We had so much anecdotal experiences doing this casework that, you know, myself and some of the other Dalit women in Equality Labs decided to conduct a survey documenting caste discrimination in the U.S., and that the data, which I shared earlier, was so profound, it activated partners in Seattle to say, hey, an API Chaya in particular was like, I think that we can support you to do a congressional briefing. And, you know, and they really held Primala Jaypal to holding that briefing because as soon as we announced it, hundreds of bigots tried to intimidate her office and Representative Ro Khanna, who was one of the other original sponsors. And he bowed out because he did not know how to, you know, manage at that time that violence. But, you know, Representative Jaipal stayed in, not just because API Chaya sent in a letter, but the feminist allies of API Chaya are all the major unions in the state of Washington and the city of Seattle. So when she saw a letter with those organizations, she saw caste not just as a gender issue, but as a workers' rights issue. And so she came forward. And that's why I was saying, you know, survivor and pe feminist politics are not ideological, they're practical and tactical. And the power that Dalit women built in the city of Seattle and are building across the country really links Dalit feminist issues with workers' issues, with student organizing, with racial and um, gender justice issues. And that's the coalition that wins in the face of bigotry and right-wing politics. And so, you know, I know that this is a small, you know, this might seem to many of your listeners like, wow, okay, this is something that's really powerful for, you know, the members of the South Asian community and those who are caste depressed. But I also want to share it as a model of what happens when we bring, when we build practical, tactical, feminist survivor power solidarities against the forces that want to throw us back. And as we look at the losses related to Roe versus Wade and the attacks on the queer community and the attacks on the Me Too movement, we need more models that experiment with these big tent coalition models, because I think this is how we build power to outlast the bigotry. Right. So, yes, I think when you join forces, when you combine, you know, um, wisdom, intention, numbers, you have a much greater chance of making a change. I think also if people feel there are safeguards being put in place along the way so that it it's not going to remain as risky 
or as dangerous to be involved. And it sounds like just by making people aware that there do need to be more safeguards, making police aware, making others who are, again, in positions of authority aware that there need to be more safeguards. Sometimes you can get other people involved because not everyone is as brave as you. And so I like to be able to say when I find out that things are changing legally and that there there's more recourse, like the the words that have now become a bit more recognized legally, like coercive control, like undue influence, uh, harassment, what constitutes harassment. Um, so people know that they have language to use to say when uh, they do have rights here or when their rights have been infringed upon. I'm wondering just how people who would like to get involved can get involved. And also, if you have a, a message for the people who are listening who are part of a more oppressed caste level and also those who are part of the dominant caste, what you want them to know as well if they're listening. Because I think it's good for for them to be kind of aware, um, maybe even forewarned about how things potentially are going to be changing at both ends of the spectrum. I think what's really important, and thank you for this question, is that people know that healing is possible in all domains. And cast oppressed people want to invite every single person that is listening to this podcast to learn about our movements and follow the work that we're doing at Equality Labs, because that's a really fast way to get plugged into the cast equity civil rights movement. And you can find us on our socials or on our website. And if you join our newsletter and you repost our tweets. It's one way to really be connected to the work and see the ongoing campaigns that we're we'll doing. But I think additionally, the other things that I really can recommend for people that want to be allies to this work is first and foremost, consider adding cast as a protected category to your non-discrimination policies. It's super easy, but in doing so, you really send a message that your institution is welcome to all and cast oppressed people that have faced um, so much violence know that you're a sanctuary that they can find refuge in, you know? So if you can do that, that's a great first step. I also really recommend that if you're someone that curates survivor circles or um, religious sanghas or yoga uh, communities, that you take the time to also, if you do land acknowledgements and acknowledgements related to race, that you also do a caste equity acknowledgement. And this is something that, you know, we've been really talking a lot about, you know, particularly in the wake of my, the launch of my book, because particularly if you're someone who practices a lineage that comes from any of the Dharmic traditions, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or Sikhism or Jainism, it's really important to really have a caste equity acknowledgement because you can, you can name that, you know, these traditions have given you, you know, great support and care and transformation, and that you acknowledge the harm that is at the foundation of these dharmic traditions and that you stand in solidarity with hundreds of millions of caste oppressed people who are working to be free. And something as simple as that creates such openness for reconciliation. So caste equity acknowledgements, another really powerful thing. And then I also really recommend uh, people celebrate and lift up Dalit figures and celebrate, you know, caste oppressed holidays and, um, you know, have that, you know, celebration of Dalit History Month in your organization, invite Dalit speakers and read Dalit books. Um, it's a time to celebrate the contributions of caste oppressed people in world history and also to welcome us in into the family of you know, human wisdom, and that we have so many traditions to learn and grow from. And certainly the the history of caste abolition is a, a really rich one to derive inspiration. Oh, that's so beautiful. Okay. I wrote these down because I want to be able to offer these also to people who are in contact with me after the show. And of course, I'll, have, I'll encourage them to listen to it, but I want to give them this in written form as well. I think just because of the, the theme of the show of indoctrination, I would love to finish off, of course, if there are you know, other things that you want to make mention of, please do. But the one last question I have is about the indoctrination piece. So much of what happens when people are taught something over and over again, and it's reinforced, and it's the explanation for things, and it's the explanation for the life that you're living, 
uh, and the the choices you have or don't, and the freedom you have or don't. So much of it is just this indoctrinated piece that people have of different uh, socioeconomic levels, uh, different genders, etc. And so we end up doing a lot of the reinforcement, a lot of the work for the controllers, just because we have developed the what what are called interjects, sort of the the language, the phrases, the automatic responses that are built into our system that we say to ourselves without realizing it. And so I'm wondering about for you, just having to move away from that kind of conditioned thinking or the conditioned explanations, what a journey it has been for you, what you've needed to kind of reorder in your mind and to make the automatic statements, maybe something that you take outside of your head and really look at and wonder if they're true and if you need to be saying them so automatically and what you've noticed for other people, what have they had to discard that's become so such a knee-jerk response already built into their minds in order to feel that they have rights, in order to feel like they're worthy of change? Well, I think one of the painful experiences of indoctrination is that you can cognitively know that these things are wrong. And in fact, you may even have the fortitude of intellect to be like, no, absolutely not. And you fight, you know, deeply for your, you know, your dignity and your self-determination in the face of dehumanizing systems. However, there's a very different story you have to release that lives in your body and your nervous system and your heart. And, and it's what I had to really confront as I wrote my book because I didn't realize how much shame still was in me. I didn't realize how just deeply in grief I was for the pain I experienced and what the experience of being dispossessed had done to my heart. And there is one thing to acknowledge it, It's another thing to take control and have the courage to release it. And I think that that is the hardest thing to do when you're trying to free yourself from indoctrination is to forgive yourself for the ways that you may have internalized the messages and to be able to let it go. And I know that sounds really simple because, you know, as someone who's been on my own healing journey, I know I've listened to other people say those things and still there were parts of me that were lingering in pain and dispossession. And I think that that's where we have to really look at the way that grace really allows us to have that opening and just the, the, the ability to love on yourself and surround yourself with beloved community that validates you in your journey from turning pain into power. And that gives you moments to pause. Like one thing I've found so moving about working with Rasma Menachem and the way that he really models this work in his processes is that, you know, it is so much, it's not just about the rush to say what has happened to you. It's about slowing down enough pausing to really fully hold the pain. And I think that that it's almost like we're on different timelines, the body and the mind about how it's understanding what has happened to us. And when we move at the pace of the body, everything is so much slower. And you know this, Rachel, as a therapist, I'm sure when you're working with people with complex trauma, you know, you may only work on one one phrase for several sessions because of how much you have to allow the nervous system to recondition around that nodal experience of pain. And that's the training we need to do. This is the offering that survivors bring to larger structural change is that we have had to metabolize violence in such a deep way. And that metabolization teaches us that all things are up for grabs when it comes to the nimbleness of what we need to shift in our egos, because we've had to do that already to survive. But for us to thrive, we need society to take on the tactical tools of survivors and to be nimble and to be empathetic, to be open to non-attachment as we create new relationships centered on consent and boundaries and love and limitless possibilities. So going through that journey, you know, the book itself is an easy, was an easy, like writing it, you know, the tactical thing of writing it was easy after I'd done the hard work of that 
metabolization and the releasing of my indoctrination as someone who was told that I was unworthy and untouchable and someone that deserved shunning and rape threats and death threats. And instead to say that I'm a child of the divine. I am a daughter of a thousand years of caste uh, abolitionist resistance. And my birthright is love. Wow. I don't think I should say anything at this point because that was the most perfect ending to this conversation. And I should just leave it there. Uh, thank you. I mean, that is just such a beautiful message. I, I hope people really hear it, not just hear it, but really absorb it. It's a very powerful thing to have grace, to give yourself that grace. People can often be much more generous towards others than they are to themselves without realizing it and uh, much more accepting and uh, letting other people be when you still have uh, sort of this voice in your head that's not at all as soft towards yourself. So I'm so glad that you are at this point where you can see how how important that is, how much it's needed, how much you deserve it, um, just by virtue of being a human being on this earth. And so you do come from a long tradition that is a beautiful tradition and also has some things about it that need to be shifted, I think, which is the same for all traditions that have been around a long time that started before there was real awareness, I think, of human nature, of difference, of acceptance, and the need to not other the others and the need to have us all see each other through the same lens and see eye to eye. Thank you so much for the conversation today. I, I loved it. And where can people find your book and find your work? I have also loved this conversation, Rachel, and I just wish you and everyone who's listening um, such love and healing um, as you take in the lessons of this conversation. Um, you can find The Trauma of Cast anywhere that you get books on both online and independent um, bookstores. You can also find me at my website, DalitDiva.com, and also on my socials at Dalit Diva and the work also um, around caste equity through Equality Labs. And you can find us on all of the socials there as well. Wonderful. Then Mori, it was an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Jay Beam and Jay Savitri. One more thing before you go. Thank you, thank you to Tenmari, who speaks so powerfully and so beautifully about what life has been like, not just for her, but people who came before her, people who are experiencing to this day what she is trying to help the world understand. When you are Dalit, when you are a particular caste, when you are at this level where you have these borders around you that are a cage where you cannot move forward, you cannot move up, and you are as low down as you can be, there's so much that happens in every direction that impacts people so internally so externally, socially, politically, there is something that happens when you feel less than in general, when you come to believe the messages about yourself, where you don't feel deserving of something more. You put up with things that you shouldn't ever have to. You might also not dream. You might not dream about a life that's better because you might think that it's never going to be attainable, so why bother to dream it? There is a hopelessness that you have to somehow push through where you can see something on the other side or at least the possibility of a life that's better. And not only is it something that people internalize, but the social construct around you also dictates how you're treated, how you're viewed, that you're seen as less than that you're othered, as they say, but that you are reduced to something that is sub, that is subhuman, sub anything, where then if people do see you that way, they will be under the very false impression that they don't have to treat you like they treat other people. They don't have to treat you with respect. 
They don't have to apologize to you when they've done something to you. They don't even have to hold back from mistreating you, abusing you. But also that they don't have to see you as you being like them. And in that way, for a lot of people, then you don't threaten them. And a lot of people will like that. They'll like that you go and you live your life somewhere in the depths below them. And they can then go about their day and live their life feeling superior, feeling that you are not going to be encroaching on their life. You won't be taking things away from them. But there's also something very powerful about what happens when people are trained to see others as less than or sometimes even less than human. There are terms that are used, uh, you know, I this is something that I think about during the Holocaust. I think about Jews being called names like vermin. And if you see a group of people like vermin, then you don't mind exterminating them like they're cockroaches. It shifts the amount of conscience you can access in response to them, or that you even bother to access or feel that they deserve for you to access in response to them. Same thing happens within cultic systems. People are seen as better than the rest of the world because they're involved in something special, but as we've talked about here, they're also seen as less than others within the group. People are often knocked down. People are made to feel like they have to work every day to be seen a certain way by the leader, uh, prove their innocence, mm, prove to God that uh, God should be rewarding them or loving them, and that you're never quite safe. You've never really, even with all your hard work or good deeds, have been able to establish yourself as this person who deserves good things and is a good person. And even with uh, thinking about particular cult groups where they have names for people like Scientology calls people a lot of names, uh, where they are, hmm, I'm thinking of all these terms, um, there are people who are considered squirrels or others who are uh, filled with what they call BTs and clusters, all these different terms, and a term that's actually not a good word to use, and I won't use it, but if people know about Scientology, it starts with a W and you can look it up, but it's the way that the world is described when they can look down on you for not being a member or for speaking out against it. I think what is also so powerful is that once you really see someone as less than, you have hampered in your own mind your ability to really see them as deserving, but also it will sometimes permanently affect someone's reputation. And how do you then break free of that? If you are able to break free from a system that, again, is so set in stone, how do you have the people around you start to see you differently, treat you differently, feel like you have rights, equal rights, equal say, You can set your boundaries just as they do. But sometimes in equal measure, the challenge is how you can start seeing your own self as being someone who is worthy. It is a huge challenge with the people I work with who have come out of relationships, family systems, cultic groups, where they were told how much value they had as a human being based on how the leader or their controller saw them or based on how many sacrifices they were willing to make for the person in charge. In any situation, still the measure of your value is measured by another person who benefits from you being beneath them. So it is very hard to feel that you have value coming out of situations like this. I think it is so important for people like Tenmori to be able to be out there saying, this really is wrong. This whole system is wrong. It never should have been instituted to begin with. And we're faced with it now. And we need to break free from it. 
And we need to not only have people start to believe that they are worthy, but have society start to see them that way. And then have the other systems in place in society see them that way, like the legal system, the police force, neighbors, boyfriends, girlfriends, whomever. It is something that does need to be revamped system-wide in every facet of a culture, every facet of a system. It's a lot of work to do, but I know you have to start somewhere. And I love that then Maury and people like her are fighting this good fight. Hopefully it will change a lot of lives and it will also change a lot of people's perceptions, not only of the other, but of themselves. Take good care. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.